Brilliant, fantastic. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for joining and welcome to the very exciting launch of the Everyone's Environment programme. It's fantastic to welcome you this morning to what I hope is going to be a really exciting project ahead. Um, I've been working in the environment sector for 15 years now and a, a sort of constant refrain over those years has been the need to recognise that the environment isn't just a wildlife, climate and nature issue, it's absolutely fundamentally a social issue. The poorest and most vulnerable people in the most marginalised communities here in the UK and around the world are going to be the first to suffer the worst effects of the biodiversity and climate crisis. And these inequalities that are already endemic in our society are likely to be only drawn out and deepened as the environmental crisis deepens. We've recognised that for a very long time, but our level of understanding about exactly how nature loss will affect different communities, about exactly how the impacts of flood and fire and drought and all those other things we're expecting from climate change will fall more heavily on some communities rather than others. Those details are things that we only still have a tentative grasp on. And so I'm really hopeful that this programme will be one that enables us to draw out the truth uh, and the terrible tales probably uh, that are likely to unfold if we don't tackle the climate and nature crisis and do so in a way that recognises that social equity has to be at its heart. Uh, and secondly, as well as not quite understanding the, the depths of those issues, we've always said, haven't we, that in order to properly tackle the environmental crisis and make sure that uh, the politicians and businesses and communities take it as seriously as it warrants, that we have to work together more closely. How many meetings have the environmentalists among us been in where we say, if only, if only we were able to connect better with um, people focused on social justice, with people focused on diversity and inclusion, with mental health and physical health, how much better would we be able to get our message across if we were able to work together? And yet somehow those bridges have remained uh, only tentative over the years. So the second thing that I very much hope this programme will do is enable us properly uh, to come together, building on that recognition of the issue, to build some trust, capital and strong action together uh, in actually tackling the issues ahead. And if that works well, let's hope that the Everyone's Environment Programme leads to some shared understanding about exactly what we need to do, uh, where those areas are with the biggest opportunity for tackling environmental crises in a way that also improves social justice and inclusion, and that we'll be able to create a common strong platform together for achieving uh, policy and social change. Get those things right, uh, and let's hope, let's hope that that gives us the energy and vigour we need actually to start making progress on environmental change. So that's the aspiration, that's why I'm very excited about the uh, Everyone's Environment Programme. Uh, and today at the launch, we have experts in each of the, uh, the, the, the detailed strands for the Everyone's Environment Programme who will be able to introduce their work to you. I should say that um, we're going to be tweeting about the launch today with the hashtag Everyone's Environment. So please do get stuck in on social media uh, and let's start telling the tale of the importance of the environment for social justice. Uh, and we hope that as well as a public conversation on social media, there'll also be a vibrant conversation here in the virtual room uh, and you can get involved, make your comments, uh, pose questions using the chat function that you'll find uh, at the bottom of your screen. We are recording the session today, so uh, please be aware of that uh, as you make your comments and um, please only be, um, please only say and share things that you're comfortable being in the public domain. So there we have it by way of housekeeping. Um, we're going to move straight into uh, the, the, the meat of the session by uh, inviting the first of our speakers. 
So one of the expert strands involved in the Everyone's Environment programme is going to be the youth strand focused on the uh, interaction of the environmental crisis uh, on young people. Uh, and I'm absolutely delighted that we've got Sarah MacArthur with us this morning from the UK Youth Climate Coalition. Uh, if you haven't come across the uh, uh, the Youth Climate Coalition, then please check it out. Uh, it's uh, a really, uh, really exciting, uh, a really exciting initiative. And Sarah is one of the volunteers uh, that works with the Climate Coalition. It mobilizes and empowers young people to take positive action for global justice. Outside that volunteer role, she works in onshore wind development. So she's got that sort of professional understanding of the renewable energy sector to bring to the table as well. So it's fantastic to be able to welcome Sarah uh, to introduce the Youth Strand. Over to you, Sarah. Thank you very much, Richard. Um, good morning, everyone. I, I am Sarah. I'm a 24 year old. I live in Edinburgh and I, yeah, like you've just been told, I'm a volunteer with UKYCC. Um, we are a group of young people who all share a common goal of, of achieving genuine global climate justice. Um, we campaign on climate change on a local, national and global level. Um, I've been involved in climate activism for four years, five years or so. Um, and yeah, like Richard just said, in my day job, I work for an onshore wind developer in Scotland. Uh, I'm also a trustee for the 2050 Climate Group, which is a Scottish charity. Uh, I think we've got Barry on the call, who works with one of our wonderful staff members. We're a Scottish charity that work to empower Scotland's young people to lead on, on action in tackling the climate crisis. Um, and we've educated and empowered well over 500 young leaders through our Young Leaders Development Programme. Um, I have been asked here today to talk a little bit about young people and the environmental crises and also what we are looking for charities and funders to support us with. Um, so I guess one of the main reasons why young people are very active in the climate space is simply because children and young people are among the most vulnerable populations at risk of being affected by the climate crises, not least because we are the generation who have our whole futures <clears throat> at risk. And this is something that sort of I and, and many others that I work and volunteer with, we struggle with what the question of, of what is our world going to look like when I'm 50 years old. Um, UKYCC, a few of our members were actually part of a research group who surveyed 10,000 young people last year three quarters of these young people said that they thought their future was frightening and that they feel confused and betrayed by politicians and adults not acting on climate change um, and not giving it that urgency that it deserves so I really think it's fair to say that young people have a, a lot at stake um, but we are also part of the solution too and it's really important that young people are included properly in decision making about their own futures and not just sort of invited along to um i don't know discussions and events um and listened to but then those actions are not taken away and they're not part of the actual decisions that come out of of that discussion um but the i guess unprecedented levels of mobilization that we have seen over the last five years um, by young people around the world with the likes of the Fridays for Future movement that shows just how much how much power we have to hold decision makers accountable. Um, I personally have gained so much joy from being part of, of local and community organising and it has helped with my climate anxiety more than any change to my personal lifestyle could have done. Um, trying to think just about how you can reduce your own personal carbon footprint or emissions can feel really overwhelming and lonely and I really think that being part of something bigger uh, finding a community to take action with I think that's so much more empowering um, and a much better and healthier way to think about the climate uh, about the environmental and climate crises and it, and it really centers the conversation around those who are responsible for the crisis which isn't you as an individual it's decades of government inaction and fossil fuel companies making profits from people suffering that and that's what's got us here and yes we do have everything to lose if climate change is not tackled now with um urgency but we also have everything to gain from the opportunities 
that can come around from a more equitable uh, and green society climate change is not this this siloed issue that acts on its own it's it, we do see it portrayed that way a lot um but it is intrinsically linked with every other sector um which is why programs like everyone's environment they're really important to link to link this conversation up of climate change with the social sector and other sectors because climate change will and and it is already exacerbating existing really damaging structures of oppression that exist in our society and at UKYCC and, and across the climate movement we really want to challenge the fundamental causes of climate change but we also want to challenge the roots of social and climate injustices so I think it's a really important point to get across that we cannot act on climate change and treat it as a single issue we need to be having conversations across the table um with people who work in, in lots of different areas because they are all linked um we unfortunately have a really glaring example of this playing out right now in the uk with with the energy the gas crisis we're seeing consumer bills rising at, at this unbelievable rate and there's devastating social impacts because the cost of gas has increased so much i mean we've seen quite recently that uh, renewable energy is selling at nine times cheaper than gas so the rapid transition to renewables and also the insulation of people's homes would would really have this twin well more than twin benefit but two main benefits of reducing greenhouse gas emissions and contributing to the fight against climate change but also reducing people's energy bills um, and that is a very real social impact of uh, tackling the climate crisis so I'm sure every charity here is acutely aware um, of the cost of living crisis, be it um, through the groups that you support or through increased cost of your own or reduction in donations from the public. Um, so yeah, I think that's a really good uh, good example to touch on. Um, and yeah, so as a young person who uh, works, volunteers, spends a lot of her time in the climate movement, I have quite a lot to say on what I would like to see from funders and charities wanting to help. Um, I can't speak for everyone, which incidentally is something that I see quite a lot. Young people being invited along to events and panels as the token youth who can speak on behalf of everyone. Um, so I think a very first important thing to recognise is that we clearly aren't some homogenous group, that there are lots of uh, intersections of difference depending on, on where you live in the world, um, how well off you are, um, and yeah, lots of other um, things that make our, our lived experiences <clears throat> and opinions on issues very, very different. Um, so that's why uh, I think the Everyone's Environment Programme is taking a really progressive uh, progressive approach <clears throat> to how we're involving young people wanting to have these these round tables with young people from, from across the country, from lots of different backgrounds and making sure that we aren't just sort of using that, that, broad, that broad brush approach. Um, but yeah, I've come up with a very short list of, of things to touch on based on, I guess, conversations I've had with the rest of UKYCZ um, of what we, we want to see. Um, number one, which is not going to come as a surprise to everyone, um, is, is funding, access to flexible funding um, as young people who are more often than not volunteering their time, having access to funds to at least cover expenses and other elements of a campaign or project are really really important um but it's also really important to have the support be accessible excuse me it's gonna take a while i got a frog in my throat um <clears throat> it's really important to have this support be accessible so simplifying application procedures allowing flexibility in the documents that you're asking for because <clears throat> if these young people haven't been in the workplace for very long or aren't used to doing applications like this then having that process being as easy as possible is really important um as well as just access to funds of course um <laughs> and another point that's come up with us quite recently i know it's often very hard to get around um but do consider if the types of groups you're looking to support, um, at least in a financial se sense, will have charity status because more often than not, the extra sort of reporting and conditions on campaigning means that nonprofit status is the way to go. Um, and it certainly has been from UQICC. So if your funding arrangements allow it um, and you're able to, 
don't just issue a blanket criteria of only funding registered charities for for other reasons um because yeah that's i know there's a lot more complicated reasons around charity status but that is certainly something that we're finding quite tricky at the moment is applying for funds and them saying we need your charity number and we don't have that um but we are an established group we've been around for over Oh, we're 15 year anniversary next year so we've been about um but we just don't have that charity status um another really useful thing is having access to trainings um on pretty much anything from media skills to legal trainings that young people can attend there's so much knowledge in the charity and non-profit um, and third sector that it's really important to be sharing that with young people who I, I'm not saying that we don't have a lot of knowledge within our own networks, but sometimes it's helpful to, for it to come from established groups elsewhere. Um, and coming back to what I just touched on in terms of young people being frightened of what our future looks like, um, climate anxiety is a massive problem that I really struggle with daily and having offers of support um, in a psychological capacity is, is really, really valuable. If that's the type of thing that your organization does or you know of others who, who offer that support, um, just having a space to talk about how we're feeling and potentially speaking to someone who is separate to our volunteer and working place, um, that is something that um, is probably worth having a further discussion on. Um, and then, a final straightforward one is access to physical space. Um, a lot of organisation, um, a lot of organising that we have been done doing over the last few years has been online, um, which is obviously a necessary outcome of COVID. Um, but as we're coming out of that, it's really important to do things in person. Because um, even before COVID, UKYCC were spread out all over the UK um, and we, do most of our organising online come together for team weekends, which are physically in person. Um, but having a place to do this organising and socialising with others is is really important. Um, so if you know of a youth climate group or even have one reach out to you, think about if you can offer up a space that you have to them or if you know of somewhere in the community that would be uh, suited to their needs. Um, yeah, there is there's lots more that we could discuss on this um, but that is exactly why this program is perfectly placed to support and address this and yeah I'm really excited to to hear the conversations that come out of this and hear all of your thoughts as well at the Q&A later on and um, so yeah I'm going to hand back over to Richard uh, thank you very much thank you so much Sarah um and Sarah will be joining our panel discussion in a few minutes time. So please do store up your questions for, for Sarah and uh, we'll look forward to, to hearing more from her shortly. Um, I saw lots of reaction from young people yesterday, Sarah, to say that um, particularly in England, uh, there was a feeling that for the for the first time that the sort of climate anxiety is, is going being multiplied by a feeling of political uncertainty that folk hadn't experienced before. Um, and that that sort of docks in again, doesn't it, the interaction between social and uh, environmental issues. And maybe one of the outputs that your youth strand might deliver is, is giving that sense of shared purpose between youth groups and environmental groups that will give some people something to get behind, give a sense of hope. Um, we will turn now to Liz Gad and Leah Davis. Uh, and they are the masterminds behind this whole programme. Um, and uh, Liz and Leah are going to introduce the, the, the Everyone's Environment programme. Um, I said at the start that I was excited about the programme because of building uh, shared evidence, building networks and building shared policy asks. But one of the other reasons I, I was excited was because of the association with Leah, who I know from years of great work before joining NPC, um, where she's head of policy and external affairs. She was uh, strategy director and executive director acting at the Green Alliance that many of you will know as a brilliant environmental think tank. 
uh, and uh, she was also senior advisor in the Mayor of London's office where she wrote the first climate change mitigation and energy strategy. My notes here tell me that Leah was instrumental in the development of London's uh, ultra low emission zone, but she's very keen to be modest uh, and say that uh, it, that, that uh, she contributed but wasn't instrumental, but I know that pretty much anything she touches turns to gold, which is why I'm excited about the programme. Liz is also fantastic and we're getting to know one another fast. Liz is principal consultant with NPC uh, and specialises in strategy, impact, effective philanthropy and change management. She's also a, a trustee of EFN, the Environmental Funders Network, and of uh, PAN, the Pesticide Action Network, who um, do all sorts of fantastic things for the sector. So over to you guys to explain the programme. Thank you, Richard. Go on to the first slide, please. There's been so much excitement in the sector as we have been forming this programme and pulling partners together. So it's just wonderful to reach the point of our formal launch today as we begin the journey together. And this is also a topic so close to mine and Leah's hearts that we're personally so pleased to be here today with you all. So why this programme and why now? We're seeing waves of crises. Uh, a recent WWF report uh, telling us that 70% of nature is in decline. In terms of climate change, the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, has said our current situation is a code red for humanity. We've got the cost of living crisis, a looming recession, COVID hasn't gone away and no doubt flu causing trouble as well this winter. It's time for us to move away from firefighting one crisis at a time. That's not going to work. What we're looking at is some very systemic and complex issues and they often have the same root causes. So we need to be collaborating to find solutions together that are positive for both people and the planet. The next slide, please. It can be quite difficult though to see what the environmental crises mean for you. And sometimes it can feel like everyone's talking about slightly different issues. There's something about heat waves here, or about electric vehicles there. So what we've done is we've identified four areas where different social groups are likely to be affected to help us to understand breaking down all these intertwined issues. The first is, the direct impact of harmful human behavior. So for example, air pollution, which contributes to the deaths of 40,000 people a year in the UK and leads to many more hospitalizations for physical and mental health issues. The second is the impact of our changing environment. So think heat waves, droughts, floods. Just taking heat waves as one example, uh, increases in temperature are detrimental to our physical and mental health can lead to reductions in our access to access basic communities and increases in temperature have been shown to increase aggression and violence in communities. Then there's how our society responds to these challenges. So the third one is that we might risk exacerbating inequality in our response. So, for example, thinking about how ethnic minority groups continue to be worst affected in a myriad of ways by social and environmental issues. All the kinds of things we need to think about as we move towards electric vehicles and how people with a dependence on those vehicles, perhaps because they're disabled, might be more affected than others. But the fourth is the potential for massive co-benefits in our response. The obvious one at the moment is insulation in our buildings, reducing our energy bills and our carbon emissions. But there are many more, including green jobs uh, as we move forward. But little is known on how different social groups will be affected in these areas, which is why the in Everyone's Environment Programme. And the next slide, please. So here are some of the folks that we're working with. Um, some have been here with us from the start, others are joining us recently, more joining every day. 
those who've been with us from the start have helped to shape the programme, including some, but not on this slide at the moment. Everyone's going to have different roles. Some will be in an advisory capacity, some will be helping us work directly at engaging different groups of people. And we'll all be collaborating to share learning and to prevent duplication of effort. So what exactly is it we're going to do together to accelerate action? Yeah. So yeah, so now it's my job to tell you what we're actually going to be doing under everyone's environment programme. So we, about 18 months ago, we brought together some of these groups and some other ones. Um, and we asked them, what do you think needs to happen? How does the sector need to respond? And first of all, they told us that, I think it's like Sarah explained very well, we're not talking about a homogenous group of people. We're talking about all of society. So they said to us, make sure that you break it down into different subsectors and probably arrange it around how the, the charities um, are all organize themselves too. So we're gonna be starting off with four subsectors. Firstly, with young people. Secondly, with people living with health conditions, that's both physical and mental health conditions. Thirdly, older people and disabled people. And then finally, ethnic minority communities. We also have some other groups that we're considering whether or not to set up strands for, so that's people um, on low incomes or living in poverty people in poorly adapted housing and people in li living in particularly geographically vulnerable areas. Now, even within that, people aren't gonna fit nicely within each group. They may fit within lots of group and within each group, there's gonna be lots of variety as well and difference between people and their needs and what they want. So we're setting up a shared learning group and that's gonna um, have representatives from each of the strands plus some other organizations as well to help make sure that, that we do share that learning between all the different strands. Um, for year one, we think we're going to have four phases. Um, the first one is um, gathering the evidence on the impacts. As Liz mentioned, there isn't much evidence out there. We're going to do that and then on behalf of all of the sector so that each individual organisation doesn't have to do it themselves. We know at the moment the social sector is really quite stretched. So we want to make this as easy as possible and be as collaborative and coordinated to be able to share some of that um, and be efficient in how we share um, resources. We're then going to ask people, so people from those different groups, we're going to run focus groups about their priorities. And we're not just going to ask them, what do you think of this environmental technology or this environmental solution? We're going to start with them and their lives, what matters to them, what challenges they're facing, and how environmental solutions can either help or hinder them. We're going to share these findings really widely with charities and funders. Um, and then finally, we're going to work to try and find some common policy ground between environmental and social charity. This is just year one of the programme. We've purposely only done year one because we think by the time we get to the end of year one, we probably would have found ourselves that there's lots of other barriers and challenges we haven't thought about that we don't know about yet. But we're hoping this will be a longer phased programme. So it'll certainly be two years of programmes. There might also be some variation. We're working with partners across um, uh, lots of the ones we just mentioned on the slide before. So this might not be exactly suitable for each strand. So we might vary it a bit as well. And what are we hoping to achieve? Well, after year one, we're really hoping that social and environmental charities have increased awareness of the impact of both the changing environment and related policies on different social groups, and that we found some po common policy ground between social and environmental charities. By doing this, we hope we're going to be able to accelerate action on the environmental crisis by social charities. And in doing this, um, ultimately, that social and environmental charities have much better information and can much better reflect the needs of different groups in both the work that they do in their programme and strategies, but also hopefully in their advocacy to government. Uh, now, as we said, we are kicking off the project um, today with a, a youth strand. And these are the great partners that we're going to be working with, as well as the Prince's Trust. And we're going to be starting that really soon. So that work on um, understanding the impacts is going to be happening from next month. Now, um, all of this is only possible because we have great funders. Um, the John Element Foundation um, gave us seed funding so we could really start this work. We run a number of roundtables um, to understand um, the needs of the organisations working with the different social groups I mentioned earlier. And we've also had some flexible um, um, funding from the William Grant Foundation, which we can use across the project, which, as Sarah mentioned, flexible funding is incredibly helpful. Um, and as Safina at the John Elliman Foundation said, um, this kind of work, there isn't a lot of funding that's going into this kind of work on the human impacts of the environment. 
So um, we're really ambitious with this program. We want to be able to run all four of those strands plus more. And the funding that we're raising is not to come to NPC. It goes to our partners to be able to work with us. And it also goes to people who will be involved in those focus groups to give direct payments to them as well. So if you do want to support the program, please do get in contact with me. And if you're a charity or um, another organization and you're excited by this and you want to get involved in one of the strands, please do get in contact with Liz. We have a very much an open door policy. Everyone is welcome. So please do get in contact. And if you want to find out more, we have lots of resources, mainly from Liz, I have to say, on our website. We have been making sure that as we have been learning, um, everything we've been finding is we've been um, developing this programme, we've tried to put up with blogs, and there's also some great resources on there in terms of a guide for philanthropists and funders on uh, the health impacts of the environment crisis, and also a guide that Liz wrote uh, uh, and was released yesterday, which is if you're new to it and you want to go into environmental funding, there's information on that. So that gives you an introduction to the programme, um, and I'm going to hand now back to Richard so we can get on to hearing from some of our panel. Fantastic. Thank you, Liz. Thank you, Leah. That's brilliant. Uh, and yes, we're going to turn to a panel discussion now. Um, I'll introduce the panel one by one before we split into a more informal uh, way of proceeding. Uh, please do, as I say, post your questions in the chat and we will try to uh, try to get to you soon. Um, I'm not sure whether people will be able to speak I don't think they can so we'll we'll read out your questions if that's okay so first of all I'd like to turn to Jabir Butt who is chief executive of the Race Equality Foundation uh, if you don't know them they are a national charity tackling racial inequality in public services to improve the lives of black Asian and minority ethnic communities and Jabir's career is an illustrious one it includes supporting Sir Michael Marmot's health inequalities work uh, in the, the Marmot Advisory Group. Uh, and we met for the, the first time at the Shared Learning Group just a couple of weeks ago, uh, and uh, really excited to be working with, with Jabir. So over to you, Jabir. Thank you for that, Richard. I'm glad you stopped there rather than embarrassing me further with the, my background. Um, in a couple of speaking engagements recently, I've been described as as uh, uh, being uh, adopting an approach of a glass half full, um, a, sorry, a glass half empty approach to to my presentations. And um, you'll have to forgive me if, if I, I adopt that approach again today. But I hopefully in 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 the couple of minutes that I've got with you, I I do want to get across some. Uh, challenging points and ones that hopefully we'll be able to address through this new initiative uh, on envir everyone's environment. Many of you will have heard the coroner's uh, report into the death of Ella Adu Kisidebra, a young girl who uh, had a long-term condition of asthma and, and, and unfortunately died at a very young age. The coroner finally concluded after a long campaign from her mother that the air, air around uh, uh, Ella's home was a significant contributing factor to her death and that actually uh, the law should be changed to, to better address uh, the impact of air quality on, on, on people's lives. Now, in, in isolation, Ella's case perhaps doesn't raise the issue of racial inequality and the experience of minority communities. But if it's put in the context of Black, Asian and minority ethnic people being more likely to, to experience asthma, and that the latest evidence suggests that the second and third generations from these communities are even at greater risk of developing asthma, it starts to give some of the picture that we need to understand. As importantly, when we've started to look at air quality through the various uh, pieces of work that have happened, including some very detailed work in, in London, we discover that Black, Asian and minority ethnic communities are much more likely to be living in areas uh, with poor air quality you know, when we use the measures that the World Health Organization has, has put forward. Some of the changes that have taken place uh, that we've talked about already, including the, the ultra low emission zone and the congestion charge that, uh, that is part and parcel of it, 
have brought about a change in that experience. The latest evidence actually suggests that the improvement in air quality has disproportionately benefited Black, Asian and minority ethnic communities so that the gap between them and their white counterparts in, in London ha has declined. However, it's still the case that they're much more likely to live in, in, in poor air quality. And this is just one example of, of Black, Asian and minority ethnic people being at the sharp end of, of, of climate change and the uh, changes to the environment. If you consider sickle cell and uh, disease, it's a disease that will more likely to impact uh, people of African Caribbean origin. And it's a disease that is particularly uh, uh, prone to, to cold weather. Uh, it often leads to a crisis and a very painful crisis as well. And work that's been done by Sheffield and Hallam University has demonstrated that black uh, uh, that African Caribbean people with sickle cell and that, that thalassemia are more likely to be in fuel poverty and more likely to experience uh, to be living in a cold home. The recent uh, crisis around uh, 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 in the summer with very high temperatures, colleagues from uh, uh, friends, families and travellers pointed out that Gypsy Roma and traveller communities living in, in caravans found it particularly difficult to manage the, 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 the dramatic rise in temperature that, experience, that they experienced. And this continues, uh, uh, there are multiple examples of this. Worryingly, some of the changes that take place uh, disproportionately the costs fall on, on, on those communities as well. If we look at the congestion chart, one of the things we've got to recognize is that something like 94% of private hire vehicles, that's mini cabs in London, are actually driven by black, Asian and minority ethnic people. And therefore, that, that imposition of a charge has been, had a direct impact on the costs of, of them performing their business. The second point, and I, I, I realise I'm taking too long, the second point is the continuing lack of, of attention to racism and racial inequality in, in, in these discussions of, of environmental change, including in, in the environmental movement. I wonder if we did a poll of the people sitting uh, attending this this discussion, whether we'd be able to identify how many organisations would say that they're they're representative of, of Britain's uh, Black, Asian, and minority ethnic community. I suspect uh, the numbers will be will be quite quite small. And while representation continues to be an issue and and. Uh, one that needs to be challenged. The third thing I think that needs to come out of this work is a proper attention to the infrastructure that supports Black, Asian and minority ethnic organisations and individuals to be involved in uh, 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 shaping the environment agenda and delivering some of the change that, that takes place. We know that the Black Environment Network doesn't operate any, any longer and its demise is, is a sad reflection of the lack of attention that perhaps funders have paid to, to, to this issue. That's not to say nobody's doing anything. The Sheffield environmental movement led by uh, Max Oleyamba is one example of people actually taking action and uh, uh, not waiting for others to, to change the way they do. The Green Skills for Work and Business uh, programme that the Black Southwest Network have developed and have just recently seen a, a group of young people graduate from there is perhaps another example of, of, of that change. But what we need is for this to become systematic. What we need is for this to become part of the mainstream. And hopefully that's what everyone's environment will help us achieve. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jabir. Uh, you make a really important point about the representativeness of the uh, organizations on the call. Um, and um, it's so important, isn't it? We've talked about the need to uh, highlight the environmental impacts of uh, on social justice, but we must also make sure it's not a one way street uh, and that the environmental mo movement wakes up to its social responsibilities. I'm really pleased to see um, Jamie Agambar on the call, uh, who's 
launched the race report project which is exactly trying to shine a light on the issue you raised about um diversity in the environment sector and there are other projects too like groundworks uh new uh program to, to diversify the sector so how do you think we strike that balance jabir before we move on to the next speaker um is it possible to to bring in different social justice charities without changing the environment sector itself um, I, I suspect uh, the, the environmental sector does need to change. Clearly, we have a responsibility in, in the social racial equality sector as well to, to embrace the issues around environmental change and how it's impacting our organisation. Uh, unfortunately, uh, for certainly for the last 12 years, it seems to have been a battle just to ensure that the, the daily job is being done necessary without uh, taking on new new issues. But it's clear that if we don't actively engage in, in understanding what the impact of the environment is on our communities, we will uh, in, uh, inevitably lead to inequality becoming worse ra rather, rather than better. But part of that has to be also about how we improve representation within the environmental movement. And that representation has to be uh, uh, done because I think that the issue of leadership that the environmental movement provides uh, is, is crucial to achieving some of the social justice aims that we're, we're engaged with. Thanks, Jabir. Uh, we'll, we'll hear more from Jabir in a minute. Please post your questions in the chat. Uh, but we're going to follow on from some of the comments you were making about the health impacts of um, environmental inequality to uh, to Dom Higgins, who leads the Health Strand. Um, and we we said before that there aren't enough bridges between the social justice and environmental movements uh, in, at the institutional level, but there are one or two people who've been holding it together for many years. And Dom is one of those brilliant bridges between the two sectors. Um, and has done a, a huge amount of individual work to bring us together. He is, to give you the formal version, Head of Health and Education for the Wildlife Trusts, uh, a federation of 46 independent wildlife conservation charities covering the whole of the UK. Over to you, Dom. Thank you, Richard. Um, and um, thank you very much uh, for inviting me today. It's, it's a real privilege, uh, certainly uh, uh, alongside uh, uh, fellow members of the panel today. I don't, I don't think really I can move on without addressing uh, directly some of the things that Jabir has raised. And um, he said, I, I suspect the environment sector will uh, uh, need to change. It's, there's no suspect about it, really. It, it has to. The, ident the barriers that that report identified, and uh, kudos, Richard, for uh, commissioning this, um, it's about you know some of those um, really institutional problems, the lack of capacity that you know that some of these um, barriers of you know the fact that some leaders are concerned within our sector about addressing it, uh, the the very fact that we don't have visible minority ethnic people in leadership roles is is a, is a critical one. You've mentioned the report that Jamie Agambar and students organizing for sustainability behind it you know we need to shine that light uh, and keep shining it and keep reporting until things change we don't have ethnically diverse recruitment for um you know i think in some instances organizational agreement about as to why increased ethnic diversity matters to the specific mission that's actually you know some really hard stuff but it, it it's got to be kind of publicly addressed i am you know i can say that at the wildlife trust we've got that public commitment to edi and we we, we are we have said we will become actively anti-racist but these things as well as staff and trustee diversity surveys changing our recruitment practices um training our staff and, and then uplifting and shining a light on some of those projects that are making a difference at a local level. And I think that's the strength of a federated. These are these are some of the things that we have to do. Um, so you know, I you know, I, I I say that as a kind of a a white man who has been in this sector for about the same time as you, Richard. So yeah, it, it's well made, but it, you, we can't we can't really shy away from it. Um, 
so so as as well as kudos to that work you know let's keep shining a light and, and let's be independently kind of monitored and held to account over that um i i would say that also um thank you jabir for the work that you did on the marmot report it, uh, you know i think we, we we've heard about the lack of evidence uh, those sorts of things to that's been my driver richard you mentioned you know a lot of our colleagues uh, they're driven by something called lawton which is about nature's recovery actually for me it's always been about that sustainable communities of what it means and and the rather depressing picture that um you know it, it was launched in 2010 in 2020 it found that inequalities had widened and access to green space is a major equity issue. Climate change is a major equity issue. And it will affect people on lower incomes, older people, people from ethnic minority uh, groups. You know, we see the same thing again and again. And so if it's anything, if I have a one wish for this program, it's that it turns this into action uh, and has some very specific terms. Sarah kind of raised a really important point earlier about you know, you know, what are the conditions of funding? You need to be a charitable status. Let's look at what are the outcomes and the actions that you are being held to uh, and and tie, you know, some of those kind of fundings to, to very specific things that make a change and make a difference. Um, so, you know, that, that would be one of my pleas. We have recognised, I think, at the Wildlife Trust that the recovery of nature, there's a line in our strategy that takes us towards 2030, and it's a collective strategy across all those 46 organisations, which is no mean feat. But it's basically recognising that um, the recovery of nature will not happen. Uh, so that is our core mission, unless it is by uh, uh, diverse uh, uh, groups of people, people who have different gate uh, entry gates and entry kind of touch points to the natural environment, things that probably uh, we haven't thought of in terms of how people come into our sector. Um, and, and the fact that we have a public commitment to be um, welcoming and, um, and communicate that feeling of somebody belonging um, to something that's quite important. Uh, there's a strand of work that, that, that we have called Team Wilder, which is essentially about a listening programme. Uh, again, we heard for, about from Sarah earlier about the importance of community organising. We need to do that. We need to go out there. We need to listen, and we need to kind of uh, uh, understand what it is that people might want from their natural environment. And it's not a case of having a slow motion bee going through, and you know all of those kind of traditional things. We we really need to stop and 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 uh, and act on what people are telling us. Um, the last thing I'll say is. Um, so uh, today, um, uh, there's a, a celebration of a, a program called Our Bright Future, and and has um, it, it's reached a, an astonishing number of young people, 11 to 24 year olds over the last seven or eight years, 128,000. But actually, it's at its core of that are some key messages, some call to actions that were um, through thousands of conversations of 11 to 24 year olds of of of. Uh, is a real cause to give me hope uh, that actually uh, what they want to see and what we are being held to account to is something a, li a little bit more hopeful. Things like um, uh, every job, not just more pathways into our sector, but every job needs to be sustainable. Every job needs to kind of address some of those uh, 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 climate issues. The fact that they want specific pathways uh, through our health services to deal with climate uh, uh, climate anxiety, the fact that they want education to change and they want to take learning in and about nature and climate outside. These are all things that do give me hope and actually would change the, the sort of engagement that we have. So um, I'm, I'm delighted to be held to account by, uh, you know, a, a growing diverse group of young people um, and and of one specific program in there and it, it's called my place and i urge you all to look it up my place was sort of um funded through this program about seven or eight years ago and it's a partnership between lancashire wildlife trust and lancashire nhs care and um through very careful kind of capacity building and learning from each side what we now have is a legacy from that program where youth mental health services, community mental health services directly uh, um, refer into 
that kind of program at Wildlife Trust, which is a six month program of employability, of connection with nature, of, of training courses and accreditation, and looking at those determinants of health that actually mean something and connect those people to the environment. That is now a, an official prescription and the growth of social prescribing is one of our real kind of options because it asks, to quote Leah earlier, it asks what matters to you, not what's the matter to you. And we know that what matters to uh, all those different groups of young people and, and the diverse populations who are not the third of people who we are engaging in environment sector at the moment, they will benefit. And if you benefit and then you understand the importance, you're more likely to take action. And so we should have a much stronger army of people who are willing to uh, stand toe to toe with some of the things that we are saying today. The attack on nature is an attack on health, uh, but we can do this by becoming more inclusive. Thank you so much, Dom. That's brilliant. Uh, and I, I think programmes like Our Bright Future um, that the Wildlife Trust runs really do change people's lives and offer opportunities where, where there may not otherwise be routes into the sector both in terms of diversity and uh, and uh, so, social and other social and demographic if you issues dom um the example you mentioned at the end there is is a is a brilliant one and the the, the question of standing toe to toe um as sectors to 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 demand change is so important it happens sometimes but the the, the sort of normal normal practice never quite makes it does it we come together and then we drift apart uh, or you get one great case study but you don't see things happening everywhere it's a humongous question but are there any are there any uh, solutions why is that the case it's a really good and difficult question um i think at the heart of it actually it lies uh, in the genuine recognition that um people and nature or people and wildlife or whatever you whatever you kind of come at it from whatever your language you use it's, it's two sides of the same point genuinely i think a lot of us people i see in our sector are driven by you know this is absolutely about nature's recovery abundance biodiversity but it's absolutely you know we we're getting pushed into smaller and smaller pockets it's not working so unless you genuinely, in business plans, in structures, in your staffing, in your volunteers, in your engagement, unless you genuinely have equity and inclusion built in. And, and so the next time there's a pandemic uh, and um, people get furloughed, you, you, you don't see that engagement staff drop off. You know, you see them go virtual. You see them get on the phones, which lots of our kind of local trusts were doing. And you see them, you know, it's just as important as the animal husbandry as the nature recovery. I genuinely feel you've got to have um, that totally embedded into all of your strategies, plans and things, and, and the rest will follow. But at the heart of it is a genuine belief. And then how do we get that is to change the look of the sector. So coming back to some of the things that Jabir and Sarah have said this morning. Um, so, yeah, it, uh, um, action. Yeah, we need action that changes that. Thank you. That's really clear. And perhaps we can always remember to mention Marmot every time we mention Lawton. That's a good bit of advice you gave at the start. Thanks so much, Dom. Uh, we've got two more brilliant panellists coming up. So I'll turn now to, to Meryl Davis. So for those of you who don't know Meryl, she is the chief executive of Reengage, which is an organisation committed to older people being heard, valued and engaged and provides social connections for older people at a time in their lives where their social circles may be diminishing. So it's brilliant to have um, that uh, age angle, which is so often forgotten as part of the conversation. Over to you, Meryl. <laughs> thank you, thank you so much. Uh, it's it's wonderful, to, wonderful to be here today. And um, I want to thank the, uh, the contrib contributors so far I think there's some um, exciting conversation about um, determination and radical action. Um, and I think, you know, we also have to be um, very aware of radical change that's going on around us. So the radically changing demographics in the world is that older people make up an increasingly large population, portion of the global population. Uh, and it is, it is very important and timely, I think, for us to be joining this conversation 
um, and looking at the relationship between the aging population and climate crises. Uh, and I want to um, discuss this today in through the through three lenses. Um, first of all, older people and vulnerability to climate crises, uh, and then the impact of ageism on climate discussions. Uh, and I'm acutely aware that ageism works in, in other directions too, Sarah, uh, and the importance of capturing older voices. Uh, so just as a bit of a sidebar, um, I'm going to be talking about older people as conceived or represented in multiple different ways. But, but for context um, of who I am and, and where I'm coming from, the older people that we work with at Reengage have an average age of 86. They live in social isolation and they experience various levels of constant loneliness. So um, that's that's who we work with. But I'm going to be talking more broadly today. So uh, first of all, coming to vulnerability to climate change, um, the statistics tell us that older people are disproportionately vulnerable to climate events um, and they are absolutely vulnerabilities that they share with other people, people who share health vulnerabilities, for example, uh, and also, of course, the, the examples that Jabir has talked about. But statistically, purely because of age, older people have... Um, a high probability of long-term conditions. And when a heat wave comes along, um, the difficulties that they experience are particularly marked because they are likely to have uh, health problems that affect thermoregulation. So they're gonna have chronic cardiovascular conditions, they're going to have respiratory illnesses, diabetes, Parkinson's, emphysema, these kinds of conditions which are statistically more likely as we age. And if we look back over the, the first couple of decades of this century, um, nearly uh, 20 years ago in 2003, there was a heat wave in France um, that killed 14,000 people, 80% of whom were over 75 years old. And similar data exists uh, for climate events like hurricanes and typhoons, where the death toll for older people was equally disproportionate um, say with Hurricane Katrina in the US or the Eastern Japanese earthquake and tsunami about a decade ago. Um, and it's also true that socially isolated older people can find it really hard to ask for help, partly because they've got limited social circles, they, they are, find themselves often, uh, you know, the last one, they find themselves alone, and because older people can feel very alone and very vulnerable, and this vulnerability means that taking basic advice is, it feels hard. So something along the sim, something as simple as leaving your windows open on a hot night is very frightening for an older person living alone. Uh, so you know we have this this increased vulnerability of climate crises, um, and and that that's the the first lens. The second one is um, to look at the factors where um, older people are seen and perceived or reported as different from younger people. Uh, so climate activism, activism is often, and uh, not surprising again, listening to Sarah, portrayed as, as something that young people do. And yet over 50s do express strong and passionate views on climate change and on nature and wildlife. Um, and sometimes they don't express views because they don't feel that they're um, well enough informed or they feel they might lack expertise. Um, so because they think that young people today are exposed to climate change education in school but that they don't really understand how to get involved in climate change communication uh, and they can't find things that are aimed at them as an audience. If, however, we look further, further afield and we look towards the developing world, there are numerous groups of older people both campaigning nationally and internationally um, and also driving small scale, local and powerfully impactful change in their communities in response to climate issues. I think we have a lot to learn from um, the developing world and from some of the climate action that's going on there. Just thinking about how we talk about older people when we cast them as retirees um, and compare them with younger people, they're seen as consumers. Uh, they're seen as people who heat their homes too, too much and then consume energy. They're seen as dependent upon cars. They're also, as retirees, perceived of as having the capacity to manage unexpected costs and cost of living crisis might bring along. By contrast, if we talk about older people as the elderly, uh, they are a social burden. And this ageism uh, can mean that social isolation, energy poverty and challenges posed by, by living in an institution aren't taken seriously enough. 
by the rest of us. Um, and yet all of those things, social isolation, energy poverty and living institutions are, are connected to climate crises. So if we are fighting ageism, uh, which we are determined to do, we need to see older people uh, being empowered through better information uh, and uh, better intergenerational communication and seeking solutions that make sense for them as well as for the young people that we've been hearing about um, from Sarah. And then uh, finally, I think that I want to just, just touch upon um, talking about the, the benefit of discussing the climate crisis with older people in the UK and asking what matters to you. Uh, so first of all, we know that the over 65s are the fastest growing demographic in the world. So um, that's a big voice and a big voice that could be um, important for change. Um, we know uh, that they are um, vulnerable, as, as that we're all vulnerable as we age, that age is a, a creator of vulnerability, and that means that we will be increasingly disproportionately affected by climate change. Uh, and we know uh, that we can consult older people on how to best protect them from the current and future crises and about what resilience might look like for them. But bringing older people into the discussion is absolutely critical. Uh, and so that's why I'm so pleased to be part of this group and part of working on this project, because actually, you know, we are going to be bringing the older people in with us um, as we get more involved in this in this project. So um, a huge thanks to everybody uh, for for including Reengage. Thank you. Thank you so much, Meryl. That was really, really clear. Um, you, you described really well some of the the sort of physical challenges that climate change might might pose for for older people. Um, I guess there's a perception sometimes, isn't there, that some of the issues like climate anxiety that Sarah is talking about are, are young people's worry. And I wonder what evidence there is there about um, uh, climate anxiety among older demographics. And it would be really interesting too to know whether actually nature anxiety is something that maybe older generations experience more because they may have actually seen the decline of, of iconic species and you know remember the, 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 that sort of generational shift in nature in a way that, that, that perhaps uh, younger folk can't. So I don't know if there's any evidence of either of those. Um, I um... I would say that there's plenty of anecdotal evidence and we work we know, with thousands of older people who do feel that they've got that knowledge and understanding of how the world was. Um, and I think there's a lot that we can do to 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 be, you know, to, to listen to older people. But yes, also to understand how I think it's just part of constant change. Um, so, yes, nature anxiety comes along with all the other anxieties. Um, and um, so I think that, you know, what what's and, and, and you know, that, I mean, for me, one of the, the 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 saddest things of all is the idea that that you're vulnerable because you can't open your window. Right. And that's pretty basic. And yet that's true of all sorts of people, older people and other people, too. Um, so I, I think it's that sort of sense of, of constant change. But, uh, but I think nature is a big part of it. Yes. And then the interventions that you see, as I say, especially if you look at some of the interventions in the developing world where you've got intergenerational um, people working together on community projects, is that the, the knowledge is the knowledge is coming in from the older people. And therefore, that helps everybody with their anxiety because they're finding solutions together. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, we have one more speaker to turn to now is uh, Dan White. Uh, Dan, thank you for joining us. Dan is Policy and Campaigns Officer uh, at Disability Rights UK. Um, he's an active campaigner on disability rights and mental health, uh, but he's also just published a series of new children's storybooks on disabilities, um, which uh, with an avid young three-year-old reader, I will be looking up immediately after this call. Uh, Dan, over to you. I say reader, listener, not reader. He's three. Dan, thanks. Absolutely no problem. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you all to my previous speakers, um, and thank you all for the work you're doing. It's, it's absolutely fantastic highlighting the minorities uh, uh, in this situation. I'd like to touch, if I may, on, on disability and climate change, just for a bit of background. I live with a hidden disability, and my daughter, Emily, she's 16. She's a wheelchair user, but also a, an ardent um, climate change activist. Um, I'd just like to say initially that um, like many other communities we see, disability is, is cast adrift when it comes to the conversation around climate change. Um, and it needs to be vocalised because not only does pollution adversely affect disabled people, it's proved that uh, pollution actually creates disability. 
in newborn children or long-term effects in adults. So unfortunately, it's a dual issue. Um, some estimates actually suggest that 200 million people will be climate refugees by 2050, according to the WHO. Uh, and already 15% of the global population has some intellectual or physical disability. So 30 million of those climate refugees will require all different kinds of support as the climate worsens. Um, this is a great number of people, of course, who feel the effects of global warming harder than anyone else and who currently have no visible input in the discussions on the subject. Um, I shall try not to be too grim, unfortunately, because this is, is this conversation, but I need to overlay the facts and I'd like to give you three major examples of why the disabled community are actually worried about climate change. Um, the first is disaster planning. Um, the disabled people are used to a constant lack of access and homes that are not built for their purposes. In the event of an evacuation from scenarios that range from fires to floods, disabled people have been unable to evacuate homes and there have been tragedies on a global scale. Disabled people every day face these structural barriers, inaccessible infrastructure, inaccessible transport, inaccessible pavements and driving bans in many city centres. All these barriers already in place make evacuation planning for the community virtually impossible. A tragic case was uh, Hurricane Katrina, which was found to have disproportionately impacted 155,000 people with disabilities, ranging from physical and visual impairments, as they were unable to be evacuated from their homes because it was compromised with unsuitable housing access. There was, of course, uh, unfortunately and very tragically, the Grenfell fire disaster, where 40% of the residents who died had a disability because they could not be evacuated. The next subject I'd like to talk about is uh, pandemics. Uh, obviously, we've just had the COVID one, which was just a terrible nightmare for every part of the community, but especially the disabled community, where um, two out of every three victims of COVID had a disability. History shows that illnesses both old and new can strike individuals living with a disability harder than anyone else due to compromised immune systems, a lack of personal assistance in daily life, some cases even because sadly of medical discrimination, as well as most health services being criminally underfunded. As climate change begins to take effect, the truth is that COVID-19 will be the first, sadly, of many pandemics to sweep across the globe. Hence this being one of the disability community's prime areas of concern. The reasons for this, um, no doubt you're many aware of, but um, regular pandemics are caused because of the loss of habitable land, land being destroyed by flood, fire or heat, which means a scenario of animals that transmits disease, bringing brought into closer proximity to humans, uh, infections jumping from species to species at a faster rate, help create new virus strains that are harder to kill. And as I said, disabled people are more likely to be vulnerable to these new pandemics that happen. Also, I'd like to touch on what I call as current exclusive environmental solutions. We're seeing massive changes to the way we live. Electric vehicles have now become the cars of choice and over the next decade will be the only type of car that can be purchased. This raises issues of affordability and accessibility of charging points, for instance. Cars are being banned from certain streets to minimize air pollution, resulting in some city centers becoming no-go areas for disabled people who find public transport or pavements simply not an alternative because of bad infrastructure and funding. Charging points are being built over disabled parking bays, for instance, and household boilers are also set to change with the issues of affordability. There is also the issue of plastics. Disabled people were unfortunately lambasted by the, uh, shall I say, tabloid press for the use of plastic straws, um, which, as the facts will say, I think only 0.03% of pollution is caused by plastic straws, when most uh, plastics that are found in the ocean are caused by fishing uh, equipment being dumped over the side. So, as you can see, it, um, a lot of facts, I'm sure they cross over into many of the conversations in the groups that we were talking about just now. But disabled people are currently excluded from discussions and solutions around climate change, meaning the impact of any legislation on those who are disabled is overlooked. I'd like to point you to a phrase called eco-ableism, which occurs when non-disabled environmental activists and governments fail to recognize the barriers that disabled people face. And I'm sure 
eco-ableism can also be turned around and used in many of the other conversations we've had today. The disability community contains a wonderful, wonderful, beautiful mix of such rich diversity and cultures. And it's a wonderful community. It probably represents every other community that we've had discussions with this morning. I'm sure many of my colleagues will agree on that. From COVID to historically a lack of uh, decent benefits, to a historic lack of poverty, from austerity, and now climate change. Disability is really feeling the actual brunt of all this. I'd just like to say um, many thanks for MPC for hosting us today. I think it's absolutely fantastic. I'd like to thank my previous speakers for the wonderful work they're doing and the conversations they've had. But I think it's most important of all that we all highlight our various issues, but also work together because I think they cross over very much. Disability crosses over very much within all these conversations we had. But like I said, climate change is threatening the existence of the disabled community. And it's time we had these conversations. It's time we were at the table of these discussions. We had our first meeting yesterday uh, of a new hopeful moving forward climate change disability group. We are hoping to actively engage COP because unfortunately COP26 last year was probably the worst ablest COP there was where wheelchairs were not, couldn't get in due to steps. Uh, there was no, no sign language interpreters for anyone and the event had to be intended in person. So obviously disabled people who were still shielding couldn't access the event remotely. And that was probably true, I would dare say, of many of the elderly people within Merrill's talk just now. So we need to have these conversations. There needs to be full inclusivity on climate action with all communities because we are part of the human condition. We are the human condition. We all just dearly do so much for the human race and we all value nature. So we all need to be included. And I would love very much to speak to any of you after this to see your points, see any reports or works you've done, see how we can cooperate or correlate. But I'd just like to thank you again, MPC, for today. And thank you all my fellow speakers and thank you everyone for attending. I hope I've made my point clear. Thank you, Dan, you certainly have. And between the, the example Merrill gave of the, the difficulty of simply opening a window and the, 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 the sort of more acute example that you gave of, of the hurricane impacts of people just not being able to escape, what more evocative examples at both ends of the spectrum could you ask for really? You, you, you also spoke about COVID uh, and obviously that's something that uh, affected people with disabilities as well as um, older people in a terrible fashion and it was a problem ultimately caused by abuse of nature as you said. Do you think do you think awareness of that at large in the community as well as in the communities that you speak to is there? I mean, do people associate these terrible events at, with environmental crisis, do you think? I don't think they do, because unfortunately, well, as you know, currently the, the government have just brushed away COVID and now it's just a case of actually living with it. All the emphasis is on this pandemic, this pandemic, when as the reality is, there are tragically going to be more pandemics. The planet is heating. I read a report yesterday about the permafrost in the Arctic is actually melting. Within that permafrost are viruses, some of which are 150,000 years old, which predate antibiotics. These things are happening around us. People are moving from warmer areas to be closer to nature. Nature is moving as well. There's going to be more cross-species jumping. We need to have these conversations. We need to have pandemic planning. I think in 2016, the government enacted a pandemic uh, training course, but none of the options or, or results were followed up from it. We need to have this in place. People need to be made aware of the dangers of pandemics because they will decimate communities, but we're not having these conversations. We need to turn it around to focus on what's coming down the line as well as what's happening now. Thank you. It seems a really good, good example of where not just preparing to respond, but actually identifying environmental harm as one of the root causes is, is a really great place to work together. We've had some more excellent questions come in, so uh, we'll turn to some, some more of those now. And I won't come to all of the panel for every question, so if um, please do wave at me, panel, if, uh, if you want to come in. Uh, and the next question that's come in is a great one from Will Humpington. Uh, he asks, uh, is it your aim that an organisation like the Climate Change Committee would use the evidence and reporting from the programme to advise the UK and devolved governments on how to adapt to the social impacts of climate change? 
that's a great uh, a great question it might be one that's mainly directed at liz and uh, and and leah perhaps but yeah, I'll answer that one um, yeah go for it, leah. i think the answer is yeah we'd hope to yes i mean i think it should come up with information i think i think that the issue we have is that um we know there isn't lots of evidence out there so what i think it will do is actually highlight where there might be more gaps and where we need more information so it's a bit of an overlooked um space at the moment but uh we're certainly with the program looking at not just national government but devolved nations as well so i'm looking forward to getting into all the ins and outs of various uh, devolved nations and even potentially regional government and their powers um so the answer is yes we hope to um, and I can see that everybody has popped up now, so it's no longer speak of you. So maybe it would be nicer for people to pose the questions themselves if they'd if they'd like to. Um, Joe, uh, Joe Hobbs, um, you've you've posed an excellent question about connecting faith communities with the environmental sector uh, and and really trying to bring this this idea of stewardship that crosses so many faiths uh, to, to life. Would you like to? put that as a as a question for us if you're still around i am still around uh hi yeah um it's just i think an interesting thing to think about when we're talking about which um different groups we're going to be targeting through the program and how groups cross because i think it's easy to go oh you know ethnic minority groups and faith groups and that's not always the same thing so let's be clear whilst there are intersections there are also differences but it is a, a group of communities who generally have within most world faiths some element of stewardship hardwired into belief structures and connections to the earth um, in different narratives um, but how much are faith communities connected into the environment environmental sector what are the opportunities to really uplift that work there were some really interesting engagements from some different faith communities in cop um, there is obviously interest but just what are the opportunities to to build that relationship as well great question i don't know what, who would like to tackle that one for us don just it, it is a great question and i won't repeat what you, you both said because it's true uh, and therefore the opportunities are i think um in the places of worship uh and you know so we often hear i in fact I was on a call yesterday at nhs forest where someone described their walk through a cemetery in walthamstone and this was where they centered themselves and they looked at things very carefully and they sat under a tree every day and people are gradually stopping coming over to her and saying are you okay and actually just realizing this is part of her daily kind of health routine and it kind of got me thinking about some of the stuff we need to do about proximity of nature and, and making it more accessible urban we find places of worship in urban uh settings don't we uh and and where people live and pray and and commune so the thing that's always struck me about the environment sector its strength is that social mix Meryl said earlier about the wisdom of retired people and the skills. That's a massive thing I've seen time and time again at, on, on practical projects. If we can start to kind of have those in those um, in those places of worship, reach a much more kind of uh, a wider audience, but also just green and blue up those places. So they're part of a kind of connected corridor through our towns and cities. I think it's a, it's a great opportunity. Um, you know, you could you could see in a way you connect up different buildings via green walkable corridors would be uh, amazing. So I think there's tons of opportunities there. Thanks, Tom. And uh, lovely things like the A Russia program aren't there for for greening um, uh, churchyards and things, uh, as well as as well as more pointy things around divestment. Uh, I can see Jabir and Meryl both want to come in on this one too. So over to you, Jabir. It's a it's a really important area uh, that Joe has raised, and you know, examples like uh, the development of the Cambridge Mosque, where uh, in environmental damage or environmental impact of the mosque was a key driver in in uh, the uh, in in the design of it, and 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 how it's it's operating is is perhaps a sign that faith organisations are starting to take these issues seriously and. And, and trying to address them as well. But I think another key part of it is that there's still a, a major debate to be had uh, with 
with the communities of faith, but also minority communities about the impact of environmental change on them, and in particular, their employment and how we address that effectively. And unless we engage with those organizations, including faith organizations, we're going to find ourselves in a, in a situation where people conclude things are being done to them rather than with them. And I, I think there's there's a real there's a real need here to to make sure we exploit that channel for to use that terrible Americanism to exploit that channel to have that discussion so that we actually engage everyone in in this process of change. I like the idea of exploiting the channel to avoid exploitation. That's a a, a nice uh, circle there. Um, Meryl, over to you. Just very briefly, I think we I just wanted to move it away from from that sort of. Um, uh, built environment that of uh, environment urban environment whatever uh, uh to, just to, to the sort of theological point that was made and i'm um i'm way out of my comfort zone here but at the same time i think the point was um around this concept of stewardship being a, a strong element of faith across a number of faiths and stewardship of the whole land um and and of nature and and actually bringing that into the conversation could be a really it is a really powerful way of talking about this in a way that resonates with some people um, in, 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 who might not find other ways that resonate with them. So I think that, you know, just understanding the, the, the theology behind it is, is a really interesting point. Thank you. Thank you. It certainly is. Uh, and um, thanks for also for contributions in the chats. Uh, um, so good good uh, comment by Theo there to have a look at the Cambridge Mosque if you haven't seen it, some uh, spectacular work there. Um, there's a, a little group of questions about the really interesting interaction uh, between age groups. Uh, so um, Paula and, and Mari both, both ask uh, about how to, uh, the different age groups can work together is Mari's question. And Paula uh, asks uh, about using those people who just uh, hit retirement. Uh, I don't know whether either of you would like to to pop up and and pose the question more succinctly than I have, or more clearly. Sure. Um, I guess my question was more. So yeah, I work in the youth climate um, sector, and um, and I definitely think that. The conversations around climate action between generations can feel a bit toxic at, at times and i'm curious Meryl, to hear your perspective and probably sarah's as well actually on how we can have better conversations around climate action between generations thank you S sarah do you, uh, we haven't heard from you for a bit do you want to kick us off and then we'll turn turn to Meryl again yeah, I can do. Oh, you put me on the spot there a little bit. Sorry, um, sorry. <laughs> no, it's a really excellent question. And to be <clears throat> quite honest, not something that we consider very much, which is probably a poor reflection on us. Um, we are a youth climate group and we make a conscious effort to be as inclusive and accessible as possible to young people. But that doesn't necessarily extend to older generations. Um, and I this is making me think that maybe we're <laughs> there's a massive gap in our work because like Barry said there is we need to be having those conversations because we're missing a really important um section of society who can be contributing to fighting um climate injustices um so I guess it's probably events like these and and making connections between the likes of UQITC and with Merrill at Reengage and um yeah, because I know through sort of other channels that I work with, do know a lot of older people who are working very, very hard in the climate space and doing a lot of um, activism and civil resistance. So there is, it's not to say that it's not there, it's just I don't think we're joining up the conversation enough. Um, so I'm interested to hear what Meryl thinks. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And you're quite right. There's some 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 truly fearless people out there who are who are and and I think that there's and it's anecdotal, but you know, people towards the end of their lives worry about their legacy and did we steward the earth well enough for future generations? And so actually, a lot of concern about what we're what we're leaving for the next generation is expressed by older people. 
Um, and I and I do think that there's there's real opportunity to to find common ground and build a stronger voice um, by working intergenerationally. Um, and well, our strap line is bringing generations together. So we'd be we'd be you know excited to uh, to to be part of a conversation about about doing something about that. Brilliant, Dan. We'll give you the last word on this panel discussion, if that's okay, because we're reaching the end of t end of time. <laughs> Absolutely, thank you. I think we only have to look at the recent, uh, I know they've been disruptive, but recent climate activist uh, organisations that have been going on lately, especially around London. If you, if you pan across the people there, you actually see how intergenerational it is. You have you have old people, you have young people, you have, you have, you have people with uh, physical disabilities. So I think the groundwork is already there when it comes to cross cooperation. I just think we actually, as a group here, uh, put brought together by NBC and then externally need to, need to reach into that and focus on that because like I said I think the base work is there it's just joining the dots up a bit more because I think all the conversations we have really really cross over so I think the groundwork is there we just need to build up from it because I, I think with a situation like this I don't think there's going to be any us and them when it comes to this conversation I, I think working relationships are going to happen I don't think anyone's going to be there to blame anyone else for the mess that they're in because if people see a common ground thread of wanting to change this that's purely going to be their central passion so I just think the groundwork's there we just need to build up with for it now thank you that's a great can I just add a little word on that it was me ever so quickly if you will Paula because yeah, we're sure. going to finish on time for Meryl really um just when you when you talked about groups talking about retirees and elderly as someone who's due to retire next year I suddenly thought my gosh I'm in that group and as someone who um I guess me and my peers all talk a lot about climate change and I just wonder whether actually looking at that group of people newly retired who perhaps have more time on their hands and have a little bit more knowledge and a little bit more um, insight maybe we can help the older generations um, and maybe there's a role within there for volunteers is all the ones to say <laughs> yeah no, brilliant I mean Paula absolutely I think that that's a really exciting and, and a really exciting thought and I think that um there's there's you know we we all sort of bridge bridge in different ways don't we and there's there is a possibility of of helping conversations stay stay focused on on not on the difference but on similarity and i'm sure that that's something that would be you know incredibly helpful so yeah absolutely oh, please, a, please please reach out i'd love to hear from you <laughs> excellent point thank you paula and thank you for the swift re reply meryl it would be a great thing uh leah and uh liz to finish this uh pro program when it comes to an end with a uh, a physical event where uh sarah and some of her colleagues are hand in hand with meryl and some of hers and dan, dan and some of his so you're showing that unity and making sure that we take the toxicity out and find the strength uh, of togetherness um we, we will wrap up now because uh, we've hit the end of this launch event it's a really exciting program i think you can already see that it's bearing fruit and some of the working groups have already begun to to do some fantastic work i can say this because while Sir link has no financial stake in this program the program is still seeking funding to support some of the strands uh, i think uh, all four of the strands that have been established so far have fantastic work underway, but NPC is still looking for support to, to make sure it can be a sustainable and effective programme. So if you can help, please do get in contact with, with Liz. Thank you everybody for coming today. Uh, thank you, Dan, Meryl, Dom, Sarah, Leah, Liz and Jabir for brilliant contributions uh, in this session today and in the working group so far. Really looking forward to seeing what this programme can deliver. Please stay engaged, everybody, and let's build those bridges between the social justice sector and the environment movement so we can tackle it together. Thank you.